The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to Hartman's Skin Integrity webinar series. Hartman is extremely proud to be working together with the Victorian Continents Resource Centre to bring this education session to you. Today is the first session of 2018 in the series titled Demystifying Incontinence and Skin Related Issues. My name is Sonia Meyer and I'm the Clinical Educator for Continence and Skin Care at Hartman. Today I am your facilitator for session one, Dementia and Incontinence. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to your presenter, Kerry Poole. Kerry is a registered nurse and a Continence Nurse Consultant. Kerry works with the Victorian Continence Resource Centre, the VCRC. At the end of Kerry's presentation, we'll open the floor for questions. Please type your questions into the chat section at any time. I will then present them to Kerry at the completion. If you cannot do this, you can certainly email me your questions and I'll pass them on to Kerry. My email address is sonya, S-O-N-Y-A dot M-E-Y-E-R at Hartman. Dot info. I hope you enjoy today's session and I'll now hand over to Kerry. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you very much to Hartman for inv inviting me back uh, in 2018 to present again. Uh, with this talk, Dementia and Incontinence, it's something I'm very passionate about and the reason it came about really is because too often we dismiss people's incontinence when they have dementia as something that can't be altered or changed or improved. And so with today's presentation, I'm really hoping to show that there may be some strategies that we can implement that may improve a person's incontinence or incontinence. It's not a given, incontinence and dementia. So I'm gonna go through um, what dementia is and how it affects toileting. I'm going to talk about some management strategies and then I'm going to briefly touch on other reasons for dementia-like behaviour. And I must point out that um, you know, today's presentation is really about people in residential aged care with dementia. So dementia describes a group of symptoms caused by a wide range, range of brain disorders. It's a bit like cancer. Cancer is a general term that covers many different types of cancer and that's what the word dementia is about. There are many different types of dementia but I've listed some of the most common types here and the first one is Alzheimer's disease and it accounts for about 50 to 80 percent of dementia and then we have vascular dementia and it's caused by vascular disease such such as strokes or often people have what we call like mini strokes and it accounts for around 20%. Then we, in about 10% of um, diseases, dementia is one of the core symptoms and an example of this is Parkinson's disease. Other examples where this can occur is Huntington's disease and creutzfeldt jakob disease or CJD, but you may know it as mad cow disease. And then dementia or Lewy body dementia accounts for around 15% and it's caused by an accumulation of a protein called Lewy bodies in the brain. Now it can be quite similar to Alzheimer's disease but it's more progressive and it frequently occurs in males between 75 and 80 years of age. Now there are some other types of dementia and this includes the frontotemporal lobe degeneration there's Huntington's disease, I think I mentioned earlier. There's alcohol-related dementia, which is often known as Korsakoff syndrome. And then there are some conditions that can produce symptoms similar to dementia. And these are unusual or a bit rare. These are um, vitamin and hormone deficiencies. Uh, depression sometimes can um, appear like dementia. Uh, medication problems and infections or tumours of the brain. So just a few stats about dementia. There are around 354,000 Australians living with dementia and whenever I read that statistic I always think there seems more people with dementia in Australia and I don't know whether it's because I go into dementia units often but to me I'm always surprised by that statistic. 
Now approximately 25,000 people in Australia have younger onset dementia and that uh, occurs between the ages of 30 and 65. And you may even have uh, residents in your aged care facilities who come in that category. So one in 10 people over the age of 65 have dementia. And as you can see, as we age, the incidence increases. So three in 10 people over the age of 85 can have dementia. And it's estimated that 1.2 million people are involved in the care of a person with dementia. And that's not just uh, staff in aged care facilities, that's also including carers or family members. And they expect the incidence of dementia to rise to around 400,000 within five years unless there is a cure. And unfortunately, I don't think there's going to be a cure within the next five years. Now, I've put this slide up um, in relation to Alzheimer's disease because a characteristic sign uh, in Alzheimer's disease is atrophy or shrinking of the region of the brain called the hippocampus. And I don't know about you, but I always fail to remember exactly where the hippocampus is. So this is really why I've put this slide up today. Now this shrinking or atrophy of the hippocampus can be seen on MRI scan and it's one of the tools used to aid diagnosis. Here's a, a really good slide uh, showing a bit more information about brain changes in dementia and specifically Alzheimer's disease. So as you can see on the right hand side of the slide, the three um, images of the brain and the first one is the beginnings of Alzheimer's disease, but it's before symptoms um, are showing. And then the middle uh, diagram is your mild to moderate symptoms. And then the bottom one is severe Alzheimer's disease. So you can see it's pretty widespread. And then when you have a look at the images over on the left side, you've got a cross section of brain of a healthy brain and you've got the cross section of a brain that's um, with severe Alzheimer's disease and it really shows that shrinking or that atrophy of brain tissue. So with Alzheimer's disease, there are more amyloid deposits in the brain. This is what contributes to that shrinking and amyloids are like clumps of protein. Now as um, people develop symptoms of uh, dementia, they may start with you know, forgetting conversations or events or appointments. They may forget where they've put things or they may become repetitive and this is something that friends and family often start to pick up on. They can also become less trusting and they lose the ability sometimes to enjoy everyday tasks, which when you think about it is quite a common symptom with depression. Can you, so you can see that you know, sometimes it, it may not be clear cut that they have uh, dementia, they, they may be showing signs of depression, so you do need to, to do a bit of investigation. And there may be other subtle symptoms with dementia and that can be things like confusion. So people may be able to, you know, do things on a, on a daily basis okay, but it doesn't take much for them to become confused when you know, their routine might be disrupted. People may also begin to develop some personality changes and they may start to withdraw from social things. So once again, there's that overlap with depression and dementia. And they can have a loss of ability in just doing those everyday tasks. And the things that I often hear uh, people describe is um, you know, with banking and finances or um, you know, paying for things and you know, managing the money at the shops. So what I want to do now is I want to have a look at the lobes of the brain and how they um, affect toileting because different steps of toileting are affected by different parts of the brain and by knowing what part of the brain is affected we may actually be able to target some strategies to help people with dementia in regards to their toileting. Now that all sounds really good but you know, how do you know what part of the brain is affected with your residents? So you will have to, uh, I suppose, get permission potentially from the client or the resident or their family to talk to the GP and get some results because these people have often had an MRI or a CT and so you can actually find out what areas the brain have been affected. And then you can implement some strategies. Now that all sounds great, but the downside is that sometimes the strategies may not be successful every day. But you know, maybe if they're successful more than 50% of the time, I still see that as a positive. 
So now with this brain, um, this person, the frontal lobe is at the front behind the forehead. So um, this person is, or this brain really is looking to the right. And I'm going to start off with the temporal lobe and that's the green lobe there at the side. So it's sort of situated around where our ears are. And it contains short and long-term memory centres. And Alzheimer's usually starts affecting this lobe first or it becomes more apparent. And the occipital lobe, which is that bluey purple sort of uh, lobe at the back of the brain, it's not really affected by dementia, but just normal ageing processes can affect um, our understanding of visual images um, based on effects to this lobe. So now just to confuse you, the brain has turned around and is now looking towards the left but I really want to concentrate with this slide on the parietal lobe and that's the one highlighted in that purple colour. So the parietal lobe, basically it helps us know where we are. So if you have damage uh, in your parietal lobe, you can often get lost on the way to the toilet. You may not be able to recognise the language around the toilet, so the actual word or sign of same toilet, it doesn't make sense to you. And then you may not actually recognise the toilet. You may not recognise the toilet paper or the wash basin. So all those things you need within toileting, suddenly you don't recognise them. And you may have trouble sitting down on the toilet in the correct position. You, you, you no longer know that you sit down, you know, with your back to the cistern. So you may um, have patients or residents who sit down facing the wrong way or they're slightly skew whiff on the toilet. And it also helps you judge how far you need to sit down to come in contact with the toilet. So you may find that you've got some residents who start to sit down and then they sort of plop or collapse onto the toilet. And that can be two reasons. One is they've misjudged the distance or it may be that they have um, deconditioned muscles and they don't have the strength to ease themselves down. The parietal lobe is also involved in colour perception and this can be affected with dementia in that lobe. So if everything's all one colour, that can make it actually more difficult for the resident to see the toilet. And a lot of toilets or en suites or bathroom these days are often um, very uh, monochromatic, so you know the, the the floors may be pale, the toilets white, the seats white, the systems white, the lids white. It's all looks lovely and clean and hygienic, but that it can actually make it more difficult for the resident to see it. And the other thing in regards to the parietal lobe is changes in surfaces can confuse uh, the residents. So, for example, uh, a change in flooring. So, if they have carpet in their room and then lino in the ensuite, that change in flooring can confuse a person. And a door frame can also confuse them. And sometimes they are frightened to step through the door frame, for, you know, from carpet to lino because they think they're stepping into a black hole and they're frightened because they, they can't see um, the floor in the ensuite. So sometimes you have to even walk in front of them and step through the doorway onto the, the surface of the ensuite for them to, to show them that they're, you know, they're not going to fall and disappear down a black hole. Next we're going to look at the frontal lobe and as I said before this is the lobe that sits directly behind our forehead. It's uh, often damaged uh, in acquired brain injuries with people and the tasks of the frontal lobe in regards to toileting is it's the lobe that um, understands the signals from the bladder or the bowel that you know telling you you need to go to the toilet. So if for someone who has frontal lobe damage they have trouble initiating toileting and if a person has their dementia changes largely restricted to the frontal lobe, once you start the resident off with toileting, they may actually be able to complete quite a lot of the toileting process. It's just that initiation that they get stuck on. And sometimes people with dementia, they 
are still getting that signal about needing to go to the toilet, but they just don't understand what it is. And so they may actually exhibit other symptoms showing that they're getting a signal. So it might be the wandering, the plucking at the clothes, you know, the agitation in the chair. They know they have to respond to this signal, but they just don't know how to. The other big thing with the frontal lobe is people get distracted during toileting. So these are the people that keep getting up off the toilet. They haven't finished passing urine or opening their bowels, but they want to get up. They forget to wipe, you know, once again, they want to get up. So this can be quite a problem. They can't sort of complete the task because of that damage to the frontal lobe. And the other thing that can be quite a concern uh, with frontal lobe damage is um, disinhibition. So you, I'm sure you've all encountered reasons like this. The frontal lobe helps us um, be appropriate and be nice. And when there's damage to that lobe, those things often become uncontrolled. So you may have people you know, playing with their genitals in public or at the dining room table, things that, you know, just really aren't that all social acceptable or you may have residents grabbing staff in inappropriate places and this can be quite tricky and sometimes you may have to have carers of the same gender um, to try and curb those sorts of behaviours but it can be quite difficult. So before we look at strategies around dementia and incontinence, we need to address any other issues that may be contributing to their incontinence in the first place. And this is the easy stuff. This is easier than trying to address um, missing steps with toileting and dementia. So first of all, when they come into um, your aged care facility, they're going to have an assessment. So we, you need to get a good understanding of what their mobility level is like and I would imagine that a physio would be doing that assessment in most facilities. It's really important to see how mobile the person is to work out what they're capable of. You know, if they've come from an acute hospital, they may have been sitting in a chair for most of the day and they may have become deconditioned. They may have had a long protracted illness and so muscles such as the uh, quadriceps and the thighs, these are a really important group of muscles and I've talked about these in previous webinars. These help people get out of chairs. So a person really needs to be able to get out of the chair to get to the toilet. So that sort of thing's important. Their balance is important. Um, they may, you don't want them to fall over on the way out of the toilet, obviously. So all these things need to be assessed. You know, can you put, you know, aids in such as a four wheel frame when necessary to improve their mobility? We need to get an idea of their fluid intake. So you need to do a bladder diary. And it's really good if you can't ask the resident, then to ask the family what was the resident's pattern at home, you know, and what. What's, what did they like drinking is really important. So they may have been a really big drinker. I was um, talking to someone today about their fluid intake and it turns out they only like chilled water. And so if they're given chilled water, then they'll drink it. So it just might be something like that that can make quite a big difference to their fluid intake. You need to have a look at their bowels. And I know, you know, bowels are a bit of a thing of mine, you know, naturally because I'm a continence nurse. But a lot of people are going to enter our aged care facility with constipation. They may have a long history of constipation at home. They may have been taking a lot of laxatives. They may have medical conditions such as irritable bowel. But if they've come from an acute facility, they may have had an illness requiring analgesias. Often bowels are the bottom of the list. So they may be on pain relief that causes constipation, but the bowels haven't been attended to or they haven't been put on a laxative at the same time. So often you've got a lot of fixing to do as part of your assessment when these people enter uh, your facility. And another really important thing is to observe the resident when they're toileting to note what steps or skills are missing, but also what they're capable of doing. So for example, they may not be able to initiate toileting at all, but once you do initiate, they may actually be able to complete quite a few steps. So you need to notice 
what steps are missing because that's when you start working on tying it in with where their dementia is and what strategies you want to implement. And then there are reversible causes uh, for incontinence and you know I'll look at a few of those later on. Okay, so how many steps are there in the toileting process? Now if you're in a room with your colleagues I want you you know to take turns, not, don't be shy, call out how many steps you think there are in the toileting process. Now when I was first asked this question I thought you know 12, 10 to 12, I thought that was a pretty, a pretty good answer. Unfortunately it was the incorrect answer. Um, there's actually around 21 steps in the toileting process and that came as a surprise to me so I don't know whether you are surprised by that. 21 is quite a large number so when you think about it there's a lot of scope there for things to go, to go wrong and if there's a couple of steps missing it's pretty hard to achieve successful toileting. It also gives you a greater appreciation if you've got children or grandchildren who are learning uh, toilet training as to you know how difficult it is and what an achievement it is to master. Now having said that once we successfully toilet we do it so many times over our lifetime it becomes very ingrained and that's important to remember so even though these people have dementia and have atrophy and shrinkage in their brain there's a lot of ingrained processes in regards to toileting that they can manage so it's once again just not dismissing them oh they've got dementia then you know there's no point trying it's very difficult sometimes because you know you work in a time poor environment and you may be working on a dementia specific ward so all the residents on that ward may have um, varying degrees of dementia. So I often suggest perhaps you pick one resident and you work as a team and focus on them perhaps for a month and just look at how you can improve their toileting rather than trying to do everyone. And you know, after a month you may not have got very far, so then perhaps you, you choose another resident and you work that way. So with the actual toileting process, I have uh, divided this into just some loose categories. Now these are my categories, so these are my headings, so um, they may be worded differently if you look at other things. So the first part of the process is recognition. We've got to recognise that desire to pass urine. And often we've got to communicate that desire to someone. We may need assistance to get there. Once we're on our way to the toilet, we have to you know, find the toilet. We have to recognise the toilet. So there's a lot of recognition involved in that process. Then we come to environment mechanics. And that may be lifting up the toilet lid, depends whether you're a lid up or lid down kind of person. You may have to lift up a dress or trousers down. Most people wear undies, not all, so undies down. Then you've got to sit down, so there's a few processes there. And then when we come to the body mechanics, so there's passing the urine or feces in the toilet, um, recognising the toilet paper, getting the toilet paper, physically reaching over and getting that toilet paper, pulling it down, wiping which can be problematic, especially people who have obesity or um, limited movements because of arthritis. They've got to put the, the paper in the toilet. So there's quite a few things to manage. And then there's more environment mechanics such as you know, standing up, undies up, trousers up, dress down, tuck the shirt in, toilet lid down, flush the toilet, identify the wash basin, sleeves up, turn the tap on, use the soap, wash the hands, turn the tap off and dry the hands. I mean, no wonder some people um, just can't manage that, there's a lot to, to organise but we're so used to doing it without thinking but it can be a step-by-step -step process for a lot of people when they have dementia. So they're the processes. Let's not forget some other considerations that we need to address. Now these are the easy fix things, well easier than fixing dementia because obviously that's not something that we can do but we've got to resolve the constipation, it's really important. 
So plenty of fruit and vegetables, two serves of fruit, five serves of vegetables each day is the recommendation. And that's around 25 to 30 grams of fibre. Now there was a study, it is uh, 10, 10 plus years ago now, but they found that residents of residential aged care facilities can have very poor oral health. So sometimes that can be a problem uh, with them getting their fibre intake because they're not chewing or they're not eating properly. Adequate fluids. This can be really, really difficult, getting people to drink enough. But you know, there are some real positives about residential aged care and that can be their routine. The routine with um, giving out fluids is great. It's reliable and consistent. We just have to tweak it a little bit to make sure that the residents are actually getting those fluids. And this involves um, all the staff and I'm talking about the people who are handing out the cups of teas and the coffees and those sorts of things. They have a really key role to play in this. So first of all, let them drink what they like. I mean, within reason, of course, but if they like drinking white tea, don't give them black coffee. Often with people with dementia, if you ask them if they want to drink, they'll say no. So I know we have to take into um, consideration people's rights, but if you put a drink in front of them, they will often drink it. It needs to be in a receptacle that they can manage. So not the little tiny teacup that they can't get their arthritic finger into. If they're going to have a beaker, make sure the spout is actually turned around and facing them. Now I know this sounds very straightforward, but I've seen this time and time again, people picking up the beaker and they can't find the spout to have the drink. So they just put it down and then they forget that it's there. There's the things like the jolly trolley. So having a socialising event around drinking, you know, raising toasts. Um, it doesn't have to be alcohol, although some facilities provide that and that sounds really nice. But even just things like sparking up apple juice, for example, but getting people to have a socialisation but sipping fluids is a way of getting them to drink more. Then there's all the creative things, you know, like junket and jelly and custard and icy poles and all those sorts of things. Now, all these things are very straightforward, but they are important. So keeping them mobile is really, really important and can also be really, really difficult. But we really have to uh, get the physios involved. You may have exercise physiologists uh, visiting your facilities. And I want to point out that there was um, if anyone reads the Australian Nurses Midwifery Journal, the, the last month, the February um, edition was fantastic. There was a great aged care section with multiple articles that I thought relevant to my talk today. But they talked about one study and there was a significant improvement in cognition, agitation, mood, mobility and functional ability for residential aged care care facility residents with dementia when they exercised. So we're starting to get research around how much this can affect not just their mobility but things like their cognition and their agitation. So we really need to try and find creative ways, <coughs> pardon me, of getting people more mobile. Now there are going to be exceptions to this, people are going to refuse to mobilise. So I know that you can't do this for everyone but where possible, we need to try and incorporate this into their daily routine. And lastly, good toilet habits. And I'm really referring to at this point in toilet habits or positioning for bowels. And so you can see uh, the diagram on this slide of the correct defecation sitting position. I can't stress how important this is. And I uh, have a lot of people say to me, staff say, oh, you know, it, it's, a footstool's too hard. And yes, it is a challenge, but maybe you have a brainstorming uh, session and work out how you can get residents to use a footstool. It might be that if you're doing a toileting round, I know some places do do that, that you, the staff have a couple of footstools that you take with you um, and you um, put them on with the residents as you're moving along, rather than leaving the footstool in the bathroom for the resident to hide or lose later on. Often people won't leave their feet on the footstool, they get distracted and that comes back to that frontal lobe um, de de 
dementia. So I have some strategies that I can talk about in a little while about how to overcome that. And with your bowels, you, you need great documentation. So something like the Bristol stool chart should be used, uh, something standard that everyone can refer to. And you also need to document the amount of poo. And I know that's probably not the most exciting thing to do, but you need some sort of baseline measurement so you're all on the same page. Because what one person considers a small amount, another person might consider a large amount. And you need consistency in this because that's how you pick up the early signs of things like constipation happening. Okay, so what are some common behaviours in people with dementia around toileting? Well, sometimes if someone is wearing a contents product, it can be very difficult to change it. They can be quite resistive. Now, you may have been looking after this person for years and you know them very well, but because of their dementia, they may not recognise you and they may wonder who this person is coming up and trying to put their hand down their pants or lift their dress up or whatever it may be. So sometimes it may be stepping back, introducing yourself, getting permission to change the product, um, taking them to the toilet, getting them to sit down, not for them necessarily to use the toilet, but making it easier for you to change the product. Get the resident to assist you if possible. You could develop a routine around the changing of the product. So it might be that you always take them into the toilet. You may play a piece of music. You may sing a song, a favourite song that they like. Um, do you have cold hands? That's something to consider. I have cold hands and would be told by patients nearly every day when I went to work how cold my hands were. So I try to warm my hands up a little bit now when I'm coming in contact um, so as not to give them such a fright. Now, urinating in a spot other than the toilet, this can be quite problematic and I hear a lot of pot plants in corridors get watered um, by someone urinating in them. So sometimes there are just too many options for a person to pass urine. And I don't want to you know, have a gender bias, but it does tend to be men more than women urinating in pot plants in the corridor. I guess it's just a bit easier. So you need to remove um, the options of where to have a wee. And I know, you know, the pot plant looks really nice in the corridor, but it's not doesn't look really nice if someone's urinating in it. So you need to move it. And maybe if a particular resident really likes that palm, maybe you put that palm beside their toilet in their ensuite. And then that will be like a beacon and they may go and urinate in the toilet more often. If they're urinating in their wardrobe, you may put a sign on the wardrobe or on the wash basin, uh, you know, out of works or do not enter or a stop sign. Often those sorts of things uh, can be enough to sort of make them think, oh, they can't go there. Ask the family about the history of toilet use. So for example, the resident as a child or as an adult may have used a china potty. Uh, for many years. So they may see a lovely vase or a, uh, a bowl with fruit in it and that may look like a, their potty to them and so that may be why they're starting to urinate in these sort of places. So you may need to have a bit of a think and talk to the family and sometimes these behaviours start when a change has occurred, and it may not be an obvious change to you, but it may be to the resident. So that might be a new palm in the hallway or the this colour of the toilet seat may have changed. If there are shadows or reflections on the floor in the toilet, that can actually confuse the resident. So, you know, you may have changed the blinds in the ensuite or the drapes. All these little things can actually have an, inf uh, an impact on the person with dementia. Um, the, the reflections on the floor, they're really particular to people with parietal lobe changes. And as I said before, you often need to reassure the resident that it's okay or safe to enter the bathroom. And often you do that by stepping through the doorway before them. 
Now, for the resident who gets distracted, this is this frontal lobe, they don't want to sit for long periods of time on the toilet, or well, not even long periods, but just long enough to finish urinating, then you have to distract them. You give them something to hold, an item from their past often. It might be a football in their team colours, preferably something that they can't then put down the toilet. It might be a stress ball, a knotted rope, something to distract them, something for them to play with. You can get boards that might have bells or you know, locks or things that you can put on their lap and they can play with that and be distracted. You could put wall stickers or photos on the wall beside the toilet. Now, it might be a photo of the um, wedding day, and I suppose some people may say, hmm, don't know whether I want my wedding photo on the, you know, the wall beside the toilet. But if it keeps them there long enough for toileting, then I think it's worth trying. The other thing is a lot of people uh, in aged care facilities, because the staff can be so time poor, the residents can be um, deficient in touch or contact, contact very often. So it might be that you um, give them a hand massage. You might use a lavender scented cream. You know, lavender is often relaxing or calming. You might rub their lower back or you, know, you talk to them in calm, soothing tones and all these sorts of things may help. So here are some more strategies to help improve the toileting process. And the first one is the toilet doors need to stand out from surrounding walls. Often the colour scheme, it's all one colour and they, they, they can't see it, they can't visualise it. So you may paint the toilet door a different colour or the door frame, or you may put a big sign with a picture of a toilet on the door, or I'm, I quite like wall stickers, they can be expensive, but sometimes family members um, will buy them as presents. Now I want you to just be aware in, in the latest A&MJ again, they, there was a pilot study in a dementia facility in New South Wales and they trialled um, door, door size stickers on the, the room doors for the residents. So when they walked down the corridor, all the doors weren't the same and they had quite a lot of success with that. So they had um, over 50% reduction in people doing persistent walking and around 43 to 54% reduction in wandering behaviours. And they had, the, the stickers were bright colours, so they might have had a blue door with a blue knocker or a, a red door with a stained glass. So it might be something like that on the toilet door that helps them you know, find it more easily. As I've said there, signs with pictures of the toilet on the door. It might be coloured water in the toilet. So if everything's all white, then you know the blue coloration you can often get with certain toiling products. That may be enough for them to differentiate and you know more easily perceive you know the depth of um, the toilet bowl, especially for men who stand, to try and aim and wee into. You want to make sure where possible um, that the ensuite is a nice environment. I mean, let's face it, you know, bathrooms are, can be pretty sterile and, and quite functional. So, you know, residents often have their room decorated, but that can extend to their ensuite as well. So you want to make sure it smells nice. You know, if the resident has a favourite scent or they wore or have a particular favourite perfume, maybe you can get um, a room spray in that scent and you can spritz the room. It, it needs to be warm and inviting. You may um, play relaxing music. You know, they may have a CD player in their, um, in their room. A lot of rooms have televisions with music channels. You might be able to put that onto a music channel. You can get countdown clocks, you know, things um, that they can enjoy using and that will lead on to the next thing when you, you distract them with sensory things. Obviously, they would they need a footstool with their, their bowels. And then you need to look at the floor surfaces. It might be there's a shiny surface or shadow. So, you know, maybe the light globes have been changed and it's a different wattage. All these tiny little things that we often aren't aware of when we've got our busy working day, but it can make a difference to the resident. Then if they're getting up at night, a night light can be really important. You know, you may have sensor mats or core bells. 
And the other thing is when you're with someone who has frontal lobe damage and you're wanting to suggest the toilet to them, it's really important that you use language that they're used to. Um, for example, you know, they might not get, you know, do you want to go to the toilet, but they might be happy with, I want to spend a penny or I've got a friend who says I need to take a whizzer. So you need to use that sort of language as well. You know, just keeping mindful of the time here. Then conscience products, and this is obviously a whole talk in itself, but a lot of people with dementia may do better in a pull-up product rather than a pad in underpants. And often pull-ups cost more, but if a resident is pulling the pad out and throwing it away or hiding in the wardrobe or heaven forbid, shoving it down the toilet and causing a blockage, the extra pads or the time to unblock the toilet, it may actually end up being more cost effective uh, to use a pull-up. All right, so talking quickly about delirium now. So delirium is a temporary and usually reversible condition that presents as sudden changes in a person's mental function. Now a person is more at risk of developing delirium if they have dementia or underlying cognitive impairment. Um, they have become acutely unwell, they're over the age of 70, they have a history of depression or poor eyesight, eyesight or hearing loss, have had delirium in the past. And delirium can sometimes be mistaken for dementia and depression. And this is where you really have an important role to play because you are seeing these people day in, day out, often more so than their family. You are at the coalface and you are going to notice these um, subtle changes early. So they're generally sudden changes. And you really, if you have a concern, you really need to you know, report it to someone. So it might be that they're more confused than usual. They're more disorientated to time and place. They may be having visual or auditory hallucinations, which can be very, very frightening. That can make them be agitated or more angry than usual or more irritable. They may have changes to their sleeping patterns. So they may be wandering more at night than they used to or yelling. So all these little changes, that it might be you that picks up on them. And ESO and colleagues found that despite the availability of screening tools for delirium, it continues to be under-recognised. And there, it is more difficult to detect delirium in people with dementia. And if you're going to use some of these screening tools, it needs to be done by people who really know the resident really well. So I'm going to talk briefly about some causes of delirium and a way that we often um, remember it is the five P's. So P, poo, pus, pills and pain. And I've got a lovely picture there of an, a beaker of urine that's obviously got a urinary tract infection. It's got that lovely cloudy sediment. I just bet it's really smelly as well. So there's just an example. So urinary tract infections can cause someone to become confused or have delirium very quickly. They can become uh, dehydrated. I've, I've heard of people being hospitalised um, within 24 hours and being, being extremely confused. So they can, things can um, deteriorate very quickly. So you really need to be onto that. So you um, need to be aware if you know if you smell that the urine is a bit more offensive or cloudy, do a full ward test. And for those people who wear a conscience product, and you can actually buy a product that will test or do a full ward test to detect urinary tract infections from the conscience pad. If someone is constipated, they can have fecal loading, the constipation can cause retaining of urine uh, and then they can get a urinary tract infection. The pus refers to infections so and once again that could be a urinary tract infection. They may have a respiratory infection so you need someone to auscultate their chest, have a listen to their breath sounds. You would as part of your routine of their um, hygiene, you'd be looking for signs of broken skin that could be infected or areas of cellulitis on their skin. So that sort of thing should be picked up sooner rather than later. Pills can be a big problem. So anytime 
an additional medication is added, you really should be having a consultation with the pharmacist for things to look out for. And maybe, um, you know, a note is taken when they're starting a new medication, you may observe them for a week or so in case anything develops so you can pick it up quite early. Um, some medications can become toxic and I've certainly seen uh, confusion with lithium toxicity. I don't think lithium is prescribed as often as it used to be, but it's something you need to look out for. And medications can interact with each other. And then pain. So the Australian Pain Society reports that people with dementia have pain and it's left untreated at higher rates than people without dementia and it can be very difficult uh, in a person with dementia to work out whether they are in pain. So I'm just wondering whether you have any assessment tools within your facilities to try and assess this sort of thing. An example is the Abbey Pain Scale. So it's an observational pain assessment tool. Um, it doesn't differentiate between distress and pain. But what you do is you look for signs when they're mobilising. So it might be um, during pressure care or being moved or showering. And if you suspect they have pain, then you use the Abbey Pain Scale. You implement an intervention, which is pain relief. And then you review that person again within one to two hours to see if there's an improvement. And that's how you sort of work out whether they've been in pain or not. Okay, so that's the end of all my talking. Uh, here are my references and I'm just going to tell you a little story that um, I heard recently of the manager who left her door, office door unlocked and when she came back she found that someone had snuck in and defecated in her handbag. So she's never forgotten to lock the cupboard again or the office again. But I sort of think, you know, these things happen. There was obviously a resident, they knew they had to go somewhere private and they probably had a black seat on their toilet in the park. So they had to find a black receptacle and there it was on the floor for them. So just that's a little tip, make sure you lock your office door. Okay, so over to you now, uh, Sonia. Thanks so much, Kerry. Um, are there any questions? And if so, could you please go to the panel and type the questions in? Now, if you are listening to this webinar on a phone or unable to do that, you can certainly email any questions to myself and I will pass these on to Kerry. So once again, my email is sonya, S-O-N-Y-A dot M-E-Y-E-R at Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N-N.info, I-N-F-O. We hope you've found um, today's webinar both interesting and useful for your practice. Um, our next webinar is on the 3rd of the 4th, uh, 2018 uh, at 3 o'clock and it will be titled uh, Assessment of Incontinent Persons. Um, once again, thank you so much, Kerry. Um, there have been no questions that have come through at this point in time. So um, thank you all for attending today and we hope that we will see you um, on the 3rd of April. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks, everyone.